Explorers have always brought stowaways with them on board. Thanks to our travels around the world, hardy creatures like rats, goats, pigs, and starlings have found their way to every corner of the globe. Not to mention our plants, microbes, and viruses. Wherever we go, life goes with us, whether we want it to or not. And when we travel to other worlds, it looks like the most extreme life Earth has ever cooked up is ready and willing to make the journey with us. Now that the big flybys are over, it's time to dig into the regolith, search for life in underground lakes and oceans, return samples back to Earth. We're gonna give life every opportunity to contaminate other worlds. What can we do to prevent it? In our last episode, we looked at just how tough some forms of extreme life can be. Fungi, bacteria, archaea, lichens, and mosses went to space, experienced hard vacuum, ultraviolet radiation, and extreme temperature changes. And then, when they came home, or in a simulated Martian surface, they came out of hibernation and started growing again. If we take any of these life forms on a journey to another world like Mars or Europa, there's a non-zero risk that they'll escape and colonize these new habitats. Of course, this is a serious risk that NASA has been aware of for decades. Earth life could contaminate the science data or even colonize a biome and push out the established life there. In order to prevent this, NASA has created the Office of Planetary Protection and developed increasingly careful techniques to prevent our Earth life from getting into another world's biosphere. This office has three main purposes to preserve natural environments across the solar system, to avoid contaminating them with Earth life, and to make sure that life from other worlds can't contaminate Earth in return. Until now, these concepts have been mostly theoretical. Our spacecraft have observed worlds from afar or landed on the surface, but future spacecraft and rovers will be digging down into the regolith, searching for life. If it's there, contact is inevitable, and sample return missions are in the works to bring material back home. When it comes to contaminating other worlds, NASA has defined five different categories of planetary protection. The goal here is to get the possibility of contamination down to 0.1%. Mission Category 1 is for any mission that has essentially zero risk of contaminating another world, whether it's a flyby, orbiter, or lander. The target needs to already be sterile, like a rocky asteroid, the surface of Jupiter's volcanic moon Io. The Parker Solar Probe, currently on its way to the Sun, fits into this category. There is no way this spacecraft could infect the Sun with a surface temperature of 5600 Celsius. Category 2 is for any flyby, orbiter, or lander going to most of the solar system. The stuff that's presumed to be lifeless, Venus, the Moon, comets, most asteroids, Jupiter and its other moons, Saturn and its moons, Pluto, Charon, and the Kuiper Belt objects. For these missions, planners are only required to document the flight plan of their mission and make sure that they properly dispose of the spacecraft at the end so it can't harm any potential ecosystems in the future. Now, this is why Cassini was crashed into Saturn at the end of its mission. Category 3 is for flybys and orbiters that are traveling to a world that might have life on it. Although there's no plan for the spacecraft to actually interact with the world, there's a chance of an accident, an anomaly, with the launch or arrival that could crash it into a region. For these missions, they need to be built in a clean room and undergo cleaning to remove large amounts of potentially contaminating bacteria. Category 4 is for landers and rovers that will actually be searching for evidence of life on another world. They'll be digging under the regolith, drilling into the ice, and sampling the cryovolcanoes. NASA's Mars 2020 rover is a good example of this. It'll be searching Mars for evidence of past life, digging its filthy Earth-built tools into the Martian regolith. 
These missions have to be built in a clean room, and any part of the spacecraft that might have contact with the surface needs to be fully sterilized. And in some cases, the entire spacecraft will need to be sterilized piece by piece to get its bacterial count as low as possible. The final category, five, is for sample return missions, where a portion of the spacecraft comes back to Earth carrying a piece of another world. For example, an upcoming Mars sample return mission. Now the concern is twofold. First, to ensure that any samples brought back to Earth don't back contaminate our planet. I mean, you've seen enough science fiction movies to know what that looks like. But also, to minimize the chance that life on Earth will infect the sample and make it difficult to know what came from space and what didn't. In the most extreme cases, every part of the return mission needs to be completely separate from our local biosphere. It has to be fully contained, and if a non-terrestrial replicating sample is found, it has to remain contained forever. Great, so scientists are being very careful about minimizing our contamination of the solar system. But doesn't SpaceX want to colonize Mars? What then? Well, I'll talk about that in a second, but first I'd like to thank James Richards, Andrew Fleckenstein, Amadis Montiero, Recycled, and the rest of our 802 patrons for their generous support. They contribute so that you can see these videos and we can make them freely available to anyone who wants to learn about space. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today and get in on the action. Of course, NASA isn't the only group planning to send humans and other life forms to other worlds and bring samples back for study. The whole point of SpaceX is to fulfill Elon Musk's dream of colonizing Mars. On the one hand, we'll have a backup for humanity in case of a global nuclear war or a killer asteroid strike. On the other hand, Humans are dripping with bacteria and other extreme life forms, and once we start living and working on Mars, it'll be impossible to prevent contamination. Back in 2015, NASA held a workshop to solve this problem and collected 47 proposals for locations on Mars that had the right mix of science, resources, and safe landing zones. They identified a series of exploration zones measuring 100 kilometers across, Inside these zones, there would be a viable landing site, habitation space, natural resources, and several spots of scientific interest. Uncrewed missions would land in these regions, providing habitats, power systems, and survival equipment. Then humans would arrive, getting the station set up and running properly. Further cargo missions would be sent, providing more supplies from Earth, and crews would rotate in and out of the station. Pressurized rovers would travel in and out of the habitation zone, returning science samples for study, avoiding regions that shouldn't be infected. Very strict protocols would be kept in place until life had been completely ruled out. As they explore more and more and fail to turn up any life, they could continue to clear the red planet and verify that it's ready for future inhabitants. SpaceX and other future Martians could target these regions to build their Mars bases, staying away from the pristine Martian wilderness. But what about into the far future, when humanity is fully established across the solar system? How much should we grind up to make our Dyson spheres? A team of researchers recently published a paper for the journal Acta Astronautica, entitled, How Much of the Solar System Should We Leave as Wilderness? According to their calculations, if our economy continues to grow at a conservative pace, it'll encompass an enormous amount of the solar system in just a few hundred years. It doubles every 20 years or so. Exponential growth, like compounding interest, gets surprisingly big surprisingly quickly. In their paper, they propose that most of the solar system should remain as wilderness, leaving one-eighth for mining and resource exploration. Billions of years of Martian history are laid down in the planet's surface features, including past and present life forms, if they're there. Same thing goes with places like Europa and Enceladus. It might seem incomprehensible that we'll destroy Olympus Mons for raw material, but do the math. There are people alive who might see it happen. So far, we haven't found any evidence of life anywhere in the solar system, and I wouldn't be surprised if we ever do. But until we've checked out, much of the solar system, we won't know for sure. At the same time, there's clearly a drive to push out into the solar system to explore and eventually settle down on other worlds. 
We've got a brief window now to get some science done before the evidence is lost forever. What do you think? How concerned should we be about the possibility of finding life in the solar system? How careful should we be before we start building bases on other worlds and grinding them up for our Dyson sphere? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so that you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes show up right on your audio device? Go to universetoday.com audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and I'll put a link in the show notes. And finally, here's a playlist.